morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Father's house. So good to see each and every one of you this morning. So glad that you came out to worship with us. You know, this past week I was doing a devotion. I was reading in Isaiah 6. And for those of you who know Isaiah 6, that's where Isaiah has this sort of like throne room moment where he sees the Lord seated and exalted, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And it also talks about how the seraphim, there was two seraphim, two angels, and they were singing, holy, 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 but it doesn't say they were singing it to the Lord. It says they were singing it to one another. So this morning, as we gather together, as we worship, yes, we are singing to God, but let's sing to one another this morning. We've done a stripped down acoustic set. I love it when we do this because we get to hear you even more sing. And that is my heart that we would all join with one voice in unity around the throne to worship our great God. And maybe the person next to you this morning needs to be encouraged. Maybe you yourself need to be encouraged. So let's sing to one another this morning. Amen. Let's put our hands together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you Come on. 
Sean, if you know that he called your name and he called you and you ran out of that grave, would you just give him a praise? Give him a shout of glory. Our God is an amazing God, and I, I know this to be true. That because of what he's done for me, I can't keep it on, in on the inside. Something has to come out because of the goodness and the grace and the mercy of our God. That we were dead in our sin, and he called us. He didn't call us with a stipulation that you would clean yourself up. He just said, come on, we'll work all that other stuff out as we go. So just come with me. Jesus saves. Jesus saves from the cross to the grave.
we're thankful for your blood that has saved us, that has redeemed us, that covers a multitude of sin. So that we can walk boldly into your presence, Father, and find shelter and safety there. In your presence, I will dwell in the shed.
said this in the, um, was led by the Holy Spirit in the first service to just say this, that if you haven't already, there's going to come a point in time where you are in a situation where you won't have a phone call to make, you won't have family nearby, you may not even have friends, so you're going to need to know how to encourage yourself. And in order to do that and to continue to push and put one foot in front of the other and not lose hope and not give up, you're going to have to know the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God. And this song is truth, that you are safe and you are hidden in the shelter of the Almighty God. If you've ever seen the wingspan of an eagle, majestic yes, yes, yes. and his promise is that we will soar on wings as eagles Amen. but when we're weak his wings they encompass around us and they keep yes. us in the safety Hallelujah. of his shelter he's with you at all times and so you can stand on the promise of this song today when it says you are my Father, we're thankful. we thankful that we serve a faithful God. Oh, you're so faithful. Forgive us for times where we have given up too soon. Help us to stay the course, to continue to press, to continue to encourage ourselves yes. with your truth. Not the noise around us, but with your truth. Help us to block it out and hear the words of, of your heart. That you love us, you're for us, and you have a great purpose for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. What if this dream that I can see could change how things are to how they could be? Two letters, that's all. If takes a chance and risks a fall. Others say why. If answers why not. Dare to take action. If starts with a thought. One little if in one little me to fight the current to swim upstream. If doesn't ask when. If says now. From here to there. If is the how. If starts sooner, stays longer, keeps the faith. Gets back up goes back to work, sets the pace. So now I'll start, I'll begin. Without the start, there'd be no win. If counts the cost, a price to pay. Sees the potential, then seizes the day. If today, then tomorrow. Show something for the breath you borrow. Take a leap, just a step, growing old without regret. Tell me now, what's your what if? What will it take to scale the cliff? You have the vision. Make it.
make it come true. Sometimes that what if is you. In the end, it goes to show there's no telling what one if can grow. Finish what you start, and then the time has come to dream again. Who knows what a day will bring? What if this changes everything? Good morning, Father's house. What if ushers are going to pass out our Easter invite cards? First, don't be that guy. Uh, Jesus. Uh, something about life. Yeah, don't be that guy. Pastor gave us a statistic the other week. It was like 80% of people that don't go to church say they would go if somebody would invite them. So what if this card today was the ticket? What if this was the ticket to that person that you've been praying for, that friend, that neighbor, that family member, or maybe that clerk that maybe you don't even know their name, but you're always in their line? What if? They came on Easter, and they got to experience what you and I know, that the resurrection changes everything. Let's flood Lake County with these. Let's just ask the Lord to please bring people in. God bless you today. I want to welcome our online viewers. Father's House, let's welcome our online viewers. It's so great. Our tech team puts this out, and it's just so fantastic today. If you have your Bibles... Can you hold them up today? And they helped me out here. They actually gave it so I could see it today. Put it in my notes for me. Let's hold our Bibles up. Let's say this today. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is life to me. Today I receive the Word. I confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am obedient. I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, all right. I am just so honored to be on this stage today. I want to thank Pastor Terry and Pastor Anita for the opportunity. They're away today, so keep them in prayer. God refreshes and renews them, brings them back safe from the mountains, you know, treacherous kind of twisty, turny roads up there. Let's keep them in prayer. It's just a blessing for them to be able to get away, and again, I'm honored to be there with you today. I'd like to start by saying some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today from my life, I don't say to glorify and tell war stories. What I do is to tell you from where God brought me and to inspire and encourage you. So we're in this series, What If? Our what if today is, what if we didn't give up on somebody? Think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. Right now, I want you to think about somebody that you've been praying for, friend, family member, loved one. And sometimes you think they're so far away from God, I don't think they're ever going to make that change. They're ever going to come back to God. I want you to lock that person in your heart and in your spirit. You might be sitting here today, and you already know, that person's me. God could never forgive me, or, you know, I just don't think I need God. I want you to lock yourself into your heart today and just be open to receive what God has. Can you do that for me today? Awesome, awesome. I want to take you on a journey today So you got to go way back, way on back in time, okay, to when I was a little, little boy, and that's a long, long, long time ago. I'm going to tell you a few things from my life. You're going to hear a few people share today that didn't give up on me. And I want to encourage you today not to give up on someone. Our opening scripture today comes from 2 Timothy 4, 5. This is a scripture our pastor shared with us last week, and when I heard it, it just really settled in my spirit. Let's say this together. Bring others to Christ. Leave nothing undone that you ought to do. Think about that. Leave nothing undone. Now, how great would it be if when you got to heaven, you stood before God and he said, you know what? You left nothing undone that I wanted you to do. You left nothing undone to bring your friends and your family members to heaven with you. Nothing. Our pastor told us last week, and I think this is a great creed for us to live with, that here at the Father's house, we will do anything short of sin to bring others to Jesus Christ. 
See, the truth remains the same. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Rick taught us this. The truth remains the same. Methodologies, technology, different things can change. But the truth of the shed blood of Jesus Christ never changes. The truth that we are all lost and we're in need of a Savior. So I love this verse, leaving nothing undone. Some of you know a little bit about my life. And for people that <clears throat> have known me for a while, sometimes they'll say, so, Tim, what went wrong in your childhood? Because, you know, when people go south or they go astray, whatever term you want to use, a lot of times they take it back to an event, a tragic event. Something happened, some sort of abuse, parent, parents split up, something. I just look at them and say, well, you know, I'm really, really not sure. Because I had the perfect childhood. I had a great, great upbringing. I want to honor my parents in that. I was raised in a Christian household. I have an older brother and an older sister. And my parents were great, loving parents. My father was a full-time pastor. My mother ran the household and worked in very many offices in the church. Um, as a smaller church, pastor's wife often did a lot. She played the piano. She ran the women's ministry did the mimeograph. Anybody remember mimeograph to make bulletins? Yeah, yeah. And then, no, okay, we, all right, anyway. <laughs> did those, um, accounting for the church, all those things. I came to know Jesus at a very, very young age. To be honest, the initial time that I asked Christ into my heart, I really can't pinpoint one time. I'm sure it was in a Sunday school class, a vacation Bible school, a children's church, somebody, some adult that cared enough to say, I'll teach children, that cared enough to say, I'll spend my time with kids, led me to Christ. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and felt God calling me into a life of ministry and service at the age of 12 at church camp. Let me pause for a moment and thank each and every one of you that have supported our youth and kids in their endeavors to raise money to go to camp. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Children's lives, youth lives are changed at camp. Kids are called into the ministry. They get a life track. They get saved. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. They find freedom at camp. So I thank you very, very much for that. Growing up, I was a pretty good kid, but I kind of always had this wandering, rebellious personality. It seems like I was just always trying to find my niche. Where do I fit in? Kind of in high school, I kind of never had one solid place to fit in. I was a decent athlete, always made whatever team I went out for, but was never like the star of any team. You know, and for those of you that can remember high school, you know, that, that was a pretty big deal then. I made decent grades, but wasn't like up in that upper echelon of, of people that, that made good grades. I ran with some bad boys, but we weren't like the real, real terrible kids. So I never really had this niche to fit into, and I was always kind of looking for that. I was involved in local ministry in my dad's churches, teaching Sunday school and children's church and in youth. But I don't think I was ever truly fully invested. I was always trying to live a double life, just trying to find fulfillment and purpose. James 1.8 tells us this, their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything that they do. Remember that person you're praying for their loyalty is divided they haven't quite yet made that step again pastor talked to us last week about not being upset with people when they make choices who haven't joined the team yet who haven't turned their lives over to Christ yet at the age of 15 an event came into our lives that set in motion a path that I would walk for a long long time my father was asked to leave the church where he pastored and basically the denomination that we were in in a very, very ugly scene in a church business meeting around my sister marrying a black guy. Now, this was the 70s, and I don't say this to disparage or talk bad about any of the elders or deacons. As a matter of fact, God just orchestrated, probably about 15 years ago, God orchestrated the ability for myself to go back to that church. We're up visiting Brenda's parents. We went back to that church. And I walked in, I really wasn't sure how I was going to feel when I walked in, but I walked in, and there were a few of the deacons that were still there. Go figure, you know, they were like 182 years old then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but this one deacon's wife, her husband had passed, and he was kind of the, the, the head deacon. She came up to me and started crying. 
put her arms around me, said, Timmy. I was like, I was 12 again, you know? She just looked at me and said, we are so sorry. And it was like instant forgiveness and grace. So, you know, people change. So I want to just throw that out there. I don't want to disparage anybody. But what happened was I let anger seep into my soul. Um, Psalms 37, 8 tells us, do not be angry and frustrated. Do not fret. That only leads to trouble. And I want to tell you that nobody made me walk away from the Lord. That was a choice. I allowed that anger to sit and fester in my heart and fester in my soul to the point where, I know you've heard this, I don't want to go to church, it's full of hypocrites. Well, you go to work, it's full of hypocrites there. You go to Walmart, definitely full of hypocrites there. But so I, I fell right into that as a convenient excuse. By the last half of my senior year, I started, you know, kind of partying and hanging out, just smoking pot and drinking cheap wine. But that, again, began to lead me down a path that would alter my life forever. I have some fill-ins in your notes today, and the first fill-in is this. What if we didn't give up on someone who has given up on themselves? See, I didn't know it then. But I had pretty much given up on myself then as far as what God wanted for me, the purpose and destiny that he had created me for. The summer in between my, two year, my first two years in college, I ended up playing on an all-black local softball team, a traveling team. These guys were all 10, 15 years older than me. Again, one single event orchestrated something that sent me down a path. I was supposed to be playing on a softball team with a group of guys that I went to high school with. Um, they told me, show up at this field this time for practice. I went there. They weren't there. Bunch of different guys there. Didn't know any of these guys. I'm standing around, you know, just, okay, all right, got my back, got my spikes, got my glove. Manager of this team just hollers over to me, what are you doing here? Dude, I'm here to play ball. I'm supposed to be playing, you know, with the speed boys. He's like, well, this is the Cornerstones. You want to you play? Yeah, I'm here to play ball. Are you any good? Yeah, I'm real good. And actually, at that point in time, I had good knees, I was. And so I, I, I ended up playing with these guys. And these guys were all 10 to 15 years older than me. And what I found out was they controlled the local party and drug scene. Nothing happened in the town that either one of these guys or their associates didn't have their hands on. They took me in as one of their own, and I instantly kind of felt at home for the first time since a kid. For the first time in my life, I felt like I had friends who just liked me for me females, status, right at my fingertips. At first, I was just kind of this anomaly, the only white boy with long braids and beads playing ball. Might be a picture up there today. That's right. It was the 80s, all right? <laughs> then I started just, you know, kind of selling weed to prove loyalty. I went from riding my 10-speed bike down to the block after softball games just to party a little bit to doing the personal driving and helping to organize security for one of the biggest all-black drug operations in that city. The boss had managed to control about 85% of the drug trade, and I was by his side. I did all of his personal driving for him. I was out front, kind of organized who could get to see him and who couldn't get to see him. We hung out at a garage front, and every weekend was just exciting. I mean, it was clubs, it was private parties, it was just excitement. I allowed myself to get caught up in the moment of what felt good to me without worrying about the ramifications of my future and how it would affect my family. At this same time, my father was still a pastor. He was pastoring a local church in a town that was probably maybe a third smaller than Leesburg, so it was a small town. So everything that I did reflected back on my father and my parents at the time. Colossians 2.8 tells us this, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. See, I allowed my mind to be taken captive by a philosophy that Satan wanted to tell me, that he knew what was better for me than God knew. Kind of what he told Eve. God really didn't say you're going to die. Go ahead, do what you want, taste the fruit, it's good. I believe the lie. Our next feeling is this. The enemy never gives up. Will you? Think about it. 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year, the enemy doesn't give up. We have to be that tenacious also. 
A friend of mine pointed out to me, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that the boss had created community, which in turn created a fierce loyalty to him and to the organization. You may be sitting out here today and you may be feeling a little lonely, a little disconnected. You may have even been coming here to the Father's house for a little while and feel like, wow, really hard to get to know people. As Miss Andrea said, as we get bigger, we have to get smaller. I want to encourage you to join a life group. Life group is where we do community together. It's where we find healing together. It's where we find encouragement together. It's where we find accountability. This summer, <coughs> excuse me, in just a couple months, we're going to do summer fun life groups, and we would love for you to host and facilitate a summer fun life group. You might say, well, I can't lead a Bible study. I couldn't do that. I can tell you this. Can you ride a bike? Can you go for a walk? Can you play a board game? Can you get kids together or families together and play kickball? Summer fun life groups. Please, if you're even remotely interested in doing community with each other in some sort of fun event, take that connection card out that Miss Andrea talked about and write down there, host a summer fun life group. We'll come beside you. We'll help train you. We'll help give you all the tools that you need to be successful. So again, the boss brought <clears throat> this organization and loyalty. And it was a loyalty that one night, three of us rescued him from a group of guys the street that we hung out on had a bar on the corner and then a, a, a street that went down. You went down about three quarters of that street and there was a, a garage down there, automotive garage that served as the front for where we hung out. Down at the end was almost a dead end. The side was um, a, a kind of a community, but a very, very loyal community. So we're standing up on the corner one night and... Um, one of the little just kind of drug guys comes hobbling up, hobbling up, talking about Joe needs you guys. Me and my buddy Doc take off running down the street. By the time we got down there, bullets are already flying back and forth across the street. So um, we get Joe, kind of get him safe. We deal with the issue at hand. Those young men learn to never come on that street again. But something else happened that night that really kind of kind of blew my mind a little bit with all the gunfire that was going on law enforcement showed up and so I'm figuring well we're all just going to jail so typically we did this and we did that this night too. gave the guns to the women because cops pretty much aren't going to search them but we figured you know they're going to kick the door into the garage they're coming in we're all going to jail certain officer comes up looks at me and again I've been in this town all my life so you know he knew me I knew him looks at me and says Tim is Joe safe? I said, yes, sir, he is. He's like, put him in your car and get him out of here. We'll clean this up. Wow. Let me know that things ran a little deeper than I thought. But see, I look at it back now, and I look at it that God had his hand on me, and that was a protection. Because it could have been a different officer that showed up that night. I could have been in handcuffs, or worse. I could have caught one of those bullets walking down that street or running down that street. Crazy things always seem to happen like that. Had another good friend of mine. He was um, kind of just one of the low, lower level drug dealers, drug user, been shooting heroin all his life. Big guy. His name was Jake. Jake stood about, I don't know, 6'5", maybe went about 350. Been shooting heroin so much that he was just swolled up all over his hands, everything. His nickname was Big Hands Jake. Had a great heart. Jake had a little white girlfriend who stood about 4'7", weighed about maybe 90 pounds. <laughs> We're sitting in Jake's Cadillac one night, just down on the street, just getting high, and here comes Linda, around the corner, fussing and fuming like she always did. Jake was like, oh, what does this girl want now? She comes to the front of the car, starts pointing her finger at Jake. He's like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen here. She pulls out a pistol proceeds to empty the revolver into the windshield. Again, a God moment. Happened to be a 22. That was back when they made cars the way cars are supposed to be made. <laughs> Late 60s, early 70s. All the little 22 bullets bounced off the windshield. Nobody hit. Jake jumps out, grabs her, throws her in the car. They pull off, go handle their business. Again, a night that I look back on and say, God protected me for a greater calling and a greater purpose. So Jake takes off, to, um, takes off to Detroit for two years. 
kind of the joke was, hey, have you seen Jake? No, Jake's dead. No, Jake's in Detroit. <laughs> A self-fulfilling prophecy, unfortunately. Jake, Jake comes back from Detroit, and um, where I lived in the projects, right across the street was the bus station at a liquor store. Satan always just puts his things in place where he wants them. So Jake gets off the, off, off the bus, and to come through the projects, which is the first place anybody would come if they'd been out of town and got off the bus, come through a hole in the fence, which led you right directly in front of my porch stoop. I'm sitting out on the stoop. It's a Saturday morning, early Saturday morning, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'm just sitting out there listening to cassette tapes on the boombox. Anybody relate? Anybody relate? Awesome, awesome. Prince's Purple Rain. <laughs> and um, Jake comes over. I hadn't seen him in two years. We sit on my stoop for about six or seven hours, just getting high, drinking cheap wine, hanging out. About six, seven o'clock that night, Jake says, come on, Tim, man, let's go get some, uh, let's go get some cocaine. I'm like, no, man, my head is pounding, dude. I'm going in here and lay down. I will see you later down on the block. So good to have you back home. Hugged him. See you later, brother. We'll hang out the night. About an hour later, somebody's tapping on my window, my buddy from across the street. It's like, dude. You seen Jake? Jake's dead. I'm like, really? You woke me up to tell me that? Okay, that's a joke. Jake's in Detroit. He's like, no. Jake's dead. They just found him around the corner. He went around the corner, ran into some young upstart drug dealer, got into an argument with him. Guy pulled out a 45, emptied the clip into him. Jake's laying there bleeding, dead. I lost a good friend that night. He's not going to heaven. But I think back and I say, God, why Jake? Why not me? You know, I had praying parents. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and in the sins which you once walked. During this time, I had a few things happen. After spending three weeks in the hospital, almost dying from a mixture of drugs and alcoholic gastritis, I managed to graduate from college with a 3.4 average and a degree in criminal justice. <laughs> I got a job at a counseling center, as, at a local counseling center. Seems like I was always bivocational. I became a father, and I became addicted to heroin and cocaine, becoming a daily user for seven years. Through it all, my parents still loved me, prayed, and never gave up on me. Time marched on. Drugs took their toll. I lost my job at the counseling service. No worries, my boys ran the local port, and the next day I had a job as a stevedore. The addiction to alcohol and free basin and heroin got so worse, I was arrested a few times with no major charges ever sticking. I'd like to bring my mom up on stage, and we're going to talk to her for a few minutes. And as she's coming up, give you another um, thing of what happened one night. Cops come to my door, and um, they trick their way in. And they proceeded to toss my project. I don't know if you've ever seen like on television where cops kind of toss somebody's house and they take everything out of the dressers, um, you know, they dump everything out of the drawers. Excuse me, let me grab this. So they dump all the flour out, all the sugar out, all the jelly out, all the mayonnaise out, you know, every, every bit of food in any container that we had, and they tossed it looking for drugs. All they found was a dime bag of weed, and they took my son's girl, my son's mother, to um, jail that night with that dime bag of weed and a bogus warrant that they used to get in. Um, the warrant was actually for her sister. Her and her sister's name were one letter apart. They knew it. They came in on purpose. They lied. They came in on purpose, and they took her to jail. Now, while that was a tragedy in and of itself, the bigger story is this. Had they come in a week before, I'd still be in state prison on drug and weapons charges. Every other week, my project, my buddy's project, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Coincidence, they picked the wrong week? I don't think so. A God moment, they picked the wrong week. My son's mother and I split up through arrests and death, the friends and coworkers. The boss kind of lost his hold on the city. Too many upstart dealers came up. I found myself on a one-way street to jail the electric chair in hell. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. I found myself very alone, but I had praying parents who never gave up on me. 
So, Mom, how did it feel to have a son walk away from God in such a drastic way? Put you on your knees. But the th thought kept going through my mind. I raised him. He knows what's right and wrong. And I never gave up on him. Awesome. Did it ever make you feel like you had failed as parents? Yes, that, that thought went through, through our minds. But you know, that was my choice. It wasn't anything that you guys had done wrong. Parents, I want you to hear that. What kept you motivated? What did you do? What did you use to stay motivated in prayer? Well, I had praying parents. Mm -hmm. And I know you spent time in the Word. Yes, definitely. And you had a community of people around you, friends and other family? That's right. And they never gave up on me or my family. So you didn't try to go through this alone? No. You had others around you? You need somebody that's going to stand beside you, whether it's family, friends, or just somebody in the church praying. Amen. And just remember, never give up. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. And my, and my parents didn't give up, even when they didn't see results. Our next fill-in is this. It's our responsibility to invest and pray. It's God's responsibility to produce results. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 says this. It's not the one who plants or the one who waters who is at the center of this process, but it's God who makes things grow. I'm going to ask my wife to come up on stage. She's going to tell you a little bit about her story and our story together. Because in the midst of all the madness, God sent me a ray of sunshine, hope, and love. Sitting in a friend's yard, I saw this girl and her sister walking up the stairs to an upstairs apartment. And I'm trying to figure out, I wonder which one is Billy's girlfriend. I hope it's not like the short one, because the short one's kind of fly, and I'd really kind of like to meet her. Just didn't know her name, didn't know anything. I'm asking my buddy Biddle, dude, which one? Oh, I don't know, man. I don't know. They're both always up there. What are their names? Oh, I don't know. Dude, you live downstairs. Come on, help me out. So I looked and looked and looked, and I finally found her one day in my best friend's uh, apartment. We're walking upstairs in his project, and I'm walking, turn around and look downstairs, and there she is, sitting on the couch with my buddy's girlfriend. And she's looking at me, and I'm looking at her, and I'm like, Doc, man, I'm going to get that girl. And he's like, no, nah, dude, she's looking at me. I'm going to get her. And I'm like, no, nah, bet it up, man. I'm going to get her. She is looking at me. Still... <laughs> Still didn't really know who she was. Did a little searching around. Found out her name was Brenda. Said, okay, I got to find this girl. Then when I found out who she was, I knew who her boyfriend was. Like, okay, well, we'll figure that one out when, that one, when the time comes. So um, a couple weeks later, I'm sitting, in the, um, sitting in a project, selling weed, hanging out with the project moms. And she comes to visit her sister-in-law to get her hair done. So, you know, I start telling any lie that I could just to get close to her. I'm like, girl, I'd put a perm in your hair. I'd braid your hair. I'd do anything. Come on, I'll do your hair. And um, so, you know, I kind of said, figured this thing out. Okay, I knew, I knew her old man had some money. And I said, wow, this would be a great summer fling. She's got a really fly car. She's cool. I like her. We'll hang out. I'll spend her man's money, not knowing that I was going to fall in love with her. But, you know, I had to deal with her man, obviously, who wasn't happy about that, right? Her father, her mother, her brothers, her nephews. And in the situations that we were both living, this relationship did not stand a chance. Mm -hmm. Because, see, as I was soon to find out, behind the cool fly exterior was the soul of someone who was lost as much as I was. Mm -hmm. Honey, tell us a little bit about your family growing up. Okay. Well, I was born in Salem, New Jersey. Um, there was 10 of us in the household, my mom and dad, and four boys, four girls. I was the youngest girl. So the house was full, always a full house of people, um, so much to the point where my friends would make fun of us when we went to the bus stop and say, asked us if we slept in shifts because there was just too many people there. 
um, raised in a Christian household, so that meant every time the church doors were open, we were in church. Whether it was usher meeting, whether it was Sunday school, altar service, which was always led by one of the mothers of the church. Um, we were involved in every program, Easter program where you had your little Easter piece with the little patent leather shoes, and, you know, we had that and made sure you did that. Plays, concerts, um, gospel choir, which was a um, the clapping and tapping type of music, children's choir, which was Jesus Loves Me, um, and to the church choir, which were the hymns of the church, like the old rugged cross. Um, I went to school in Quentin, New Jersey, and that was back when school was from, um, um, like a head start to eighth grade. And um, I was, I remember that day now, I think, think I still have like flashbacks because I was so little and they always called me little Brenda. Um, and when the bus door opened, this guy, Moswell had been King Kong, he was massive. And I was scared to death. Um, so that was just like the worst experience ever for me. Um, and uh, went to Salem High School, graduated in 1982 um, and went right to work after that. So tell us about when you started, when you moved out. Moved out, and um, I moved out of my mom's house when I graduated. It was right next door with my son's, my oldest son's father. And right next door to my mom's, right across the street from his mom. So we were right there, not too far away. Um, moved in with him. His name was Charles. Um, and even though we had a child together, it didn't fix a bad relationship. Um, things were not really good, and I started to experiment with drugs and alcohol, and one, led, one thing led to another to um, snorting cocaine and then smoking cocaine, um, which led to myself, and I was in a, uh, at a point in my life where I just wanted to get up, be, give up because it wasn't supposed to be like that. How would your parents react? Well, they, they prayed for me, and yeah. they didn't give up on me. Um, they said, girl, they would look at me and say, girl, I don't know what you're doing, but you really need to get yourself together. Get your life together. We're going to pray for you, but you really need to make a change. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and even though, you know, things were like that, you know, and with drugs and alcohol and stuff, relationships and experiences like that can't change the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so then I found the man of my dreams. Who was well, that? You. <laughs> Whew, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it at the time. I figured we were just going to hang out, you know, hang out a little bit in the summer, just have some fun. Um, even though the fun um, in relation, even though the fun and plans like that, I mean, still just didn't make things work. Um, so in between family and pressures and drugs and, you know, my mom and dad and sister situations with a white guy. My mom wanted to know why would I get involved with a white guy. My, your sister's had a bad experience already. Um, so we, we kind of separated. And then he sent me an engagement ring in the mail. Yeah, our, our relationship got, got really bad. I moved to Florida to try to get together, sent her an engagement ring. Yeah. And, you know, just, just a real quick note about her parents. Brenda's great parents. Yes. Her dad's going to be with the Lord. Her mother's still alive. And um, what went from them not speaking to me, not allowing me to even talk to her on the phone, just went to a perfect, beautiful relationship. Mm -hmm. So the point where we'd go up and visit, thank you, thank you. We'd go up and visit, and we'd be in the room, and all, all the kids would be in the room, and Pop would be spinning his stories, and they'd all get up one by one and leave, and leave me and Pop in there. Me and Pop would just sit in there for hours, yeah, and, and her mom, nice. man, her mom just loved me, and I just, I, I just love Mom Hill to death. Yeah. Our relationship got really bad. I came down here to Florida. I asked Brenda to marry me about a hundred times. She said yes. She said no. When she finally came down um, to marry me, I had to go up to Jersey and get her, and we argued all weekend, but she decided to come down. She came down with no luggage, no anything, but this dress that she had on her back that I keep to this day as a reminder of what God did for us. And also, kind of honor to my mom. I'm up there. I had no idea how I was going to get her down there because I only bought a ticket for myself. Call my mom up on the phone. Mom whipped out the credit card to buy my future wife a ticket to come down. That yeah, was awesome. So Brenda comes down, and, you know, at first our relationship wasn't good. I went to work for the state of Florida. 
um, as an investigator. Go figure that. I cleaned up from drugs, but I started drinking a lot because I saw that that's how the other half did it. I'd get off work and I'd start drinking with, um, literally, I'd be in the bars with cops, caseworkers, judges, lawyers that I'm working with on a daily basis. And I was like, oh, so this is how the other half does it. Okay, I can do that. But our, our, our life together was very tumultuous. Brenda went back and forth to Jersey, spent a lot of time on buses back and forth. But honey, what prompted you to turn your life back over to God? Well, um, I mean, God, I know God had a plan for my life. Um, my mom, they never gave up on me, and they always prayed, and they always said that, they, that God had a purpose for my life. Yeah. So, I mean, I wanted to, um, you know, have a, a Christian household and to hopefully have that our relationship would be great if that would, was to happen. When our daughter Tatiana was born, Brenda had given her heart back to God, and she just became this super mom and the woman that I had always seen in her that she would become. She became a great mother, a great wife. And again, I'm not serving God now, and she is. So now I got praying parents, I got praying in-laws, and I got a praying wife who has not given up on me. Right. Everything came to a head one night when um, for the first time in, I don't know, we'd been down here seven years, five years, something like that. Mm -hmm. For the first time, Brenda came home and caught me smoking cocaine. I hadn't done any, like, you know, hard drugs since I'd been in Florida. What do you remember about that night? Well, it was kind of tragedy. Um, I knew that look because I'd seen it so many times before. Not Demon. just Yeah. Not just with him, <laughs> but with myself. So when I walked in and he was looking like a deer in headlights, um, I was devastated, in my heart devastated, but I knew that God had put us together, and I knew that um, there was no need to lash out in violence, but I knew that, you know, God had a plan for us. So I told him, I said, if I ever come home to this again, I will pack up my daughter, your son, and we will be out of here. We'll be gone. Um, but it didn't make sense to do that. I knew if I gave him that ultimatum that he would pick us because he loved us more than his self life itself and I mean he would go die for us so I knew that if I gave him that choice that he would pick us. It was an amazing night because after she walked in my dad was on the porch we were watching um, Florida Florida State it was like 96 that second game that they played okay and my dad was like I kept wondering where Tim and Jimmy my brother-in-law kept disappearing to you know yeah. <laughs> and so Pop went home. She threw Jimmy out of the house. Yes. And I, I was just, I was ready. Come on, let's do it. We're going to argue all night. But she didn't. She responded in love. So the next day, I had to go to work. And I'm driving down um, Route 33 towards Mascot. And I hear this song come on the radio. It's a song by The Who called Bargain. And in the song, um, Roger Daltrey is singing about a lost love. And he says, to win you, I'd stand naked, stoned, and stabbed. I call that a bargain, the best you'll ever have. It's the tagline for the song. God spoke to me, and he said, that's what my son did for you on the cross. Yes. Right there, I gave my heart back to God. The Lord restored me, gave me a second chance to raise my family, restored my calling in ministry, helped us to raise three wonderfully successful kids. Mm -hmm. He's brought us here to fulfill our ministry and to serve at the Father's house. We're truly home. Yes. And as a side note, I want to tell you that the boss is saved, yes, sanctified, is. Serving, serving as God. an elder in his church. Yes, the same yeah. church that Brenda grew up in yes, as a kid. Is, yeah. <clears throat> so Brenda, just kind of wrap us up here. Okay. Um, what if, you know, with Tim's in our relationship, he, um, he never gave up on me. Tim saw in me what I didn't see in myself. And there, there is somebody that's out there that sees something in you, it might be you, it might be a family member, it might be a loved one, that sees something in you or that person that they don't see in their self. And I just want you to know, don't give up. What if you were to give up? What would happen to them? So don't give up, don't give up on them. Um, Tim didn't give up on me and he saw a person that, I don't know. Our parents didn't give up on us, no, my mom didn't. and dad. My yeah. wife didn't give up right. on me. No. I want to encourage you today not don't to give, give up. up. That Whoever. person that you thought of in the beginning, if yes. that person was you mm -hmm. or if that person was someone else, I want right. you to not give up. Don't. Kind of in closing today, Luke 15, 20 tells us this. And this is from the prodigal story of the prodigal son. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. What if the father had given up that day? He was a businessman. What if he was tired? 
What if he said, I don't have time to pray today. I don't have time to look for my son. I have business. He would have missed that opportunity. The verse goes on to say, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. See, the father not only didn't give up, but he embraced him in the dirt. He didn't wait for him to get cleaned up. He loved him where he was. Will you not give up today? What if you don't give up? What if we continue to love people where they are? The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Your last fill-in today is this. If you're out there today and you say, Tim, my story's not as crazy as yours, or dude, my story's 10 times crazier than yours, and I need Jesus. I want you to put your name in these blanks. If you're already saved and you know that other person you've been praying for, as I read this, I want you to write their name in the blanks. I'm going to read it with my name in here. This is from Romans 8, 35. Can anyone, anything separate Tim from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves Tim if Tim has trouble or calamity or is persecuted, hungry, destitute, in danger, or threatened with death? And Paul goes on to say, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate Tim from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither Tim's fears for today, nor his worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate Tim or your loved one from God's love. No power in the sky above, in the earth below indeed. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate Tim from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord you to bow your heads with me today please if you've been sitting out here maybe even through the worship or through prayer or through the greeting or through a word that Brenda or I or my mom spoke you're saying you know what I need to make that decision for the first time or I need to make that decision again I've kind of wandered away from Christ I want you to just look up here make eye contact with me and put your hand up I'm not going to embarrass you I just want to pray with you today just to say hey Tim Man, include me in that prayer. I know that I need Jesus today. I know that I just need to pull myself back. Thank you over here on the side. Thank you in the back. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands going up all over this auditorium. Thank you, thank you. We're going to make rededications. We're going to make first-time dedications. I'm going to say a prayer with you today. Church, we're all going to say this together so that no one person is singled out. But you've got to believe in your heart. I'll give you words. You have to believe in your heart. Let's say this together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, commit myself to you. I commit myself to you. Thank you for the forgiveness. Thank you for the forgiveness. As best as I know how. As best as I know how. I want to serve you. I want to serve you. I want to honor you. I want to honor you. And I want to help bring others to you. And I want to help bring others to you. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's celebrate today.